Good morning. Today we're going to be talking about the short story Blood Child by Octavia Butler, with in addition to being fantastic, also has a very interesting interpretive history. So at the time it was released, and apparently even now, it seems that most people see it as a story about slavery and exploitation and dominion, while Butler herself is on record as saying that she saw it as a symbiotic and loving relationship between two species, and the story of a man choosing to be pregnant out of an act of love and desperation. Now, there is a lot of distance to cover between these two ideas, but I think something that's important to note about Butler is that she is someone who believed that what an audience brought to a story was just as important as what the author put into it, which is not true for a lot of authors out there, which I find really, really fascinating. So as someone who loves the story, who in some moments saw it as a story of slavery, but in other moments it was giving me, you know, shape of water axioms and vibes, uh, <laughs> I think that there is merit to both her intent intent and see what it seems to be the most common interpretation. Although of course I'm sure there are people out there who did not read it as solely a story of slavery, I being one of them. I think that'd be very, very reductive. So if you have not read it yet, please do. It is less than 30 pages and it is fantastic. But know that this video is going to have a lot of spoilers. I'm not going to walk through page by page, scene by scene, but I am going to hit a few key moments, a few key chunks, and try to interpret them through both of these lenses to see what is revealed. So this is Blood Child by Octavia Butler. The first thing you should know is that it focuses on the relationship between a young man named Gan and an alien insect-like creature named Tigatoy on her home planet. In addition, she is a very powerful political leader among her own kind. The way that the relationship between humans and the Tlick work on this home planet of the Tlick is very, very interesting. So the first thing we're going to talk about is age. Now, humans in this context can live the average amount of time that a human would live on Earth, or they can live up to two times their lifespan if they continue to imbibe in sterile eggs. The sterile eggs of the Tlick, when imbibed by humans, causes them to relax and rejuvenate and heal. So that's one thing. The second thing that I think is important to know is that the way that they talk about age in this book is very interesting because they give you no numbers. So for example, the story begins on the last night of Gan's childhood. Now to my mind, that could be 13 or 14 if the last night of childhood is him entering puberty. That could easily between be between 18 and 20 if it's about him leaving home and being independent and starting a family. Because Gan and Tika Toy have a romantic, maternal, sexual, mate-like relationship, and issues of consent are going to come up throughout this entire book, I think it matters how old Gan is, yet we don't know. Butler never tells us. And I'm going to start putting some images of fan art that I found online. Of course, none of this was commissioned by Butler herself, including the art, though, that showed up in the science fiction magazine in which she first published the story. As you can see, there's a lot of variation in this. In some of these stories, Gan looks maybe 12, and others he looks like a man, like 19 or 20. Now, whether someone we whether someone is the age that we would consider a child or adult doesn't always be is not always the deciding factor about whether something is consensual, as we will see when we talk about the power dynamics between Tikatoy and Gan, but I think it matters. And I also think it matters that Octavia Butler did not give us a specific age. Something that I find very, very interesting about stories like Shape of Water, about stories like Call Me By Your Name, actually, is the way that age plays into it. When we look at Shape of Water and we're looking at a story in which a creature is considered to potentially be a river god, we have no idea how old that creature is. When we're looking at a story like Call Me By Your Name, where we know one person is 24 and one person is 17, that caused a lot of controversy and questions around, did Elio, the 17-year-old, really consent to this relationship? Is that appropriate with that amount of age gap? Is the age gap more important because they're humans? Because then, of course, we can talk about Twilight. In that story, we know for sure that Edward the vampire died during the Spanish flu in the early 1900s, or I guess 1910s. And we know that Bella, the main female character, is a teenager. 
I think age is important because the way we talk about age in situations in which both characters are human and situations in which a character was human but now is something else, a vampire, and a situation in which a character was never human at all, all seem to affect our perception. So that is something you should know. We are not 100% sure of how old Gan is. The second thing I think we should talk about is the preserve, where the human beings on this planet live. So these human beings fled Earth because there was violence and disease and slavery and came to this Tlick planet. They came with the idea that they were going to colonize the planet because colonization seems to be what humans do best, but quickly learned that was not going to be the case. After a period of tension and violence and death, the Tlick and the humans came to an agreement. The humans could all live on the preserve, their families would be kept intact, they could work and live pretty much independently within this confines. However, they were not allowed to own motor vehicles and they're not allowed to own guns, even though every family hides guns on this reserve. So we're looking at a group of humans who are restricted in their movements and are restricted in what they are allowed to own and operate. Yet, multiple humans in the story, Gan and his family members, acknowledge the fact that their existence on this preserve far exceeds the quality of their life on Earth, and it also exceeds the quality of their life beyond the preserve. And when it comes to the questions of what lies beyond the preserve, this is where we get into the meat of the story. In addition to not having motorized vehicles, not having guns, the third stipulation that kind of uh, makes up the bulk of the symbiotic relationship between humans and the Tlick is breeding is hosting eggs. One child from each family must host at least one brood of Tlick eggs. The way Tlick reproduce is in a parasitic sort of way. What they used to do was find four-legged mammals, animals that you know we would consider farm animals, put their eggs inside of that animal, and then when the larva break out of the egg and start eating the flesh of the animal, kill it, and then once the larva have emerged from that animal, they're strong enough to survive on their own. They, however, they found that humans are much better pr uh, protectors, providers, and gestators of their young. Mm -hmm. So instead, when it's time for the larva to eat their way out of the egg, of course, the human is in a lot of pain, similar to pregnancy cramps, their mate will sting them, put them to sleep, and perform a C-section to take the larva out and sew them back up. So... I can already imagine what some of your thoughts are right now about the idea of people being forced to bear the young of another creature. But something I wanna bring up is that interestingly enough, this is seen as an improvement in this context of the story compared to what was happening before. Before when the humans first came there, any Tlick was just snatching up whoever they wanted, breaking up families, forcing them to have sex with each other to you know, create more children. They didn't see them as intelligent. They didn't see them as having any you know, creative power. They just saw them as farm animals. And it actually was Tiga Toy's family when she was young that rose to political power and said, this has to stop. There has to be a better way of doing this. And the main reason that the Tlick want to use the humans is that their children turn out stronger and bigger and healthier than when they were implanting the eggs in animals. So what I find really fascinating about the specific relationship between T Gan and Tiga Toy and the context of this relationship is that both of them, although of course they are of different ages, were born into a world in which humans and Tlick exist on the same planet, in which everyone knows that humans want to be protected, want to live a life of peace, cannot go back to Earth, but also that the Tlick know that the humans are very good hosts for their young. Gan is introduced to Tika Toy five minutes after his birth. She is with him his entire life, and for the majority of the uh, book, he doesn't fear her, he doesn't view her as that different from him. He describes loving the way she moves and the way that she speaks and being incredibly comfortable, being intimate with her. And when I say intimate, I don't mean sexually, I mean in terms of wrapping limbs around each other, laying on the couch together. She has been a part of his life since as long as he can remember. And he would not exist without her because she is the one that introduced his mother and his father together. So between the two of them, they have an even more symbiotic relationship than perhaps the average uh, Tlick and the average Terran, what it's, which is what they call humans. However, it's really important to know that throughout this entire story, until a very pivotal moment, Gan actually doesn't know what 
hosting the eggs and tails. He knows that it's a great honor. He knows that Tiga Toy chose him when she, he was very young and chose to grow up with him in a sense in order to form that bond, but he's never seen it happen. And unfortunately, Tiga Toy has to perform an emergency C-section on another human whose mate has abandoned him. It is a gruesome, painful, horrifying experience. And once Gan realizes what it actually entails and realizes that there is a world in which Tiga Toy might sacrifice him to save her own young, he is terrified and that changes the course of the story for the second half. So something that I find really interesting about this is people who talk about the specific scene in which she is opening up a human without anesthesia because her anesthesia will not put him to sleep the way his mates will and is so focused on getting the larva, getting the eggs, that she's not paying any attention to his pain or his suffering. Her focus is getting these live young and she she ends up saving him, but he is not the priority. And you find out later that Gan's older brother, the reason he hates the Tlick in a way that Gan does, Gan does not, is because he saw a human being being eaten alive by these larvae and then killed by his mate because unfortunately he went into labor when they weren't near any homes or hospitals and she was not willing to sacrifice her young in order to save him. This sounds incredibly gruesome, incredibly cruel, incredibly inhumane, and I think it is. However, these scenes also reminded me of every single freaking uh, uh, Facebook and Instagram thread that was like, hey, you're in a burning building and you have to choose between your spouse and your baby thoughts and then watching the chaos that emerged in the comments there are so many people hypothetically online but also in real life who prioritize the lives the survival of the baby of the larva of the offspring over the person that is bearing them and in our context that is most often that is women now there are stories that are praised as heroic and i totally understand why of individual women who have made the choice to sacrifice themselves for their child perhaps they decide not to undergo chemotherapy because they want to become pregnant. Perhaps they decide to not take life-saving medication because that would affect their fertility. Perhaps it's a situation in which the male spouse or the female spouse has to decide where the doctor should prioritize his or her time. I don't know why I'm doing all this his or her nonsense when I could just use gender neutral pronouns. Anyway, there are situations in which the spouse has to decide for the spouse that is unconscious or on the table or in pain, are we going to prioritize my spouse's life or are we going to prioritize the life of the child? And that happens all the time. And there also seems to be some cultural pressure I've noticed on the people who push back, on the people who are like, yeah, no, I want to live or I want my spouse to live. So the question about whether or not it's ethical what Tiga Toy is doing, prioritizing the young of her own species over the pregnant host of another species, Obviously, as someone who's human, I know what I would want her to do in that situation, but looking at the way humans among ourselves treat people who are pregnant and the babies that they're you know, bearing into the world, I don't know if it's so far out of line <laughs> with what I see in our own reality. And so I find that very, very interesting that that horrifying moment is what really helps Gan realize how different he is from Tiga Toy. And there's a moment where he says he realizes now under different circumstances that she would be the predator and he would be prey, something he was never conscious of before. And yet I still also wonder what his perspective of pregnancy and childbirth would be like if he was living on earth in our modern times and he was, you know, standing in the waiting room waiting for his spouse or his partner and his baby to come out all fresh and healthy. And the doctor says, she's losing an incredible amount of blood. She's in tons of pain. We may not save her and the child. Who are we prioritizing? I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, but I think that question should be asked. The next thing that I think is really fascinating about this book in terms of symbiotic loving relationship and slavery is that while Gan and Tiga Toy seem to have a specific relationship, and it's hinted that the man who has the emergency C-section has a similar relationship with his mate, that is not the case for everyone, as there are many, many people, and by people I mean uh, humans, who 
did not get the option to form such a bond with their mate. They were sold off as children. Some of them lived beyond the walls of the preserve and were taken and kidnapped. Some of the people were desperate for money and were bribed in order to bear these eggs. There are many different types of relationships that were not as loving and as symbiotic as perhaps the one between Gan and Tiga Toy. So even though they're the main characters of the story, truly Gan is the main character, can we look at that relationship in the context of everything else that's happening and say, is this whole system a symbiotic relationship or is it exploitation? And there can be moments of actual respect and love within that. Or can respect and love actually be earned, can be gained, can be valid in a situation with such a powerful power dynamic differential? because it makes me wonder what types of power dynamics are present in our own relationships. I mean, people make fun of all the time the young, beautiful women who date or marry older, wealthy men. I'm assuming the women who do that do it in a consensual fashion, but there's also a power dynamic there when one person is providing your resources, your lifestyle. And again, I'm not comparing old men to <laughs> aliens. I'm just saying our own personal relationships, whether they're between people of different races, people of different intersections of privilege and oppression, people who are from like actual royalty, actually incredibly politically influential, powerful families and regular folks, there's that as well, but is the fact that we're both the same species mean that those power dynamics are suddenly not as important? Because I think about stories like, you know, white German World War II soldiers who fe fell in love with black American nurses. And I wonder, even in a context in which the two people, two communities, two nations are at conflict, are in war, who one nation definitely believes that they are better than the other and believes they have the right to subjugate and enslave the other, you had this individual story of two people who came together and got married and had children and as far as we know, lived a happy, fulfilling life. So is it possible to find genuine love under such, such circumstances? I think that's beyond my pay grade, but again, I think it's something to consider. Now we're gonna get into the ending of the story because I think it's really important when we talk about consent and free will and also love. But again, if this had been enough for you and you don't wanna hear what actually happens at the end, take a pause. Eventually, Gan gets a gun from where the place where his father hit it and he considers committing suicide because he feels killing himself will be the only way that he can provide actual control over his body and over his life. Tiga Toy comes in the room and she first interprets the gun as a threat against herself, which says something about her character. But they end up having this back and forth where Gan demands to know, does she love him? Does she respect him? Does she see him as more than just cattle, more than just a host? And she doesn't really have answers for these questions other than to say she chose him and that she would protect him. Then she suggests, if you don't wanna carry my eggs, I don't wanna give them to someone who won't love them. So how about I put them in your sister because I do have to lay my eggs tonight. And at first, Gan seriously considers this, but in the end, he chooses to let Tika Toy implant him with her eggs if she chooses to let his family keep the gun. Because remember, the guns are banned, they have to be turned in, but that is their trade-off. He retains some autonomy and power by having that, and she gets to lay her eggs that night in the person she originally wanted. What I find most fascinating about what's going on for him internally in this is that later on, when she asks what changed his mind after the eggs are implanted, part of him didn't want his sister to go through what he is going to have to go through because she has no idea what it entails and now he does. But the other part of it, he admits, is jealousy. He wanted to keep Tiga Toy for himself. He didn't want to share her. And I find that fascinating that even after everything that he's experienced in his life and everything that he witnessed that night, he still feels a sense of possessiveness, something that he describes as love for her. And in the final moments of the story, she expresses love for him and promises that she'll never leave him and always protect him. However, how true are either of those things? Did he ever have a choice in loving her when not only was did he spend his entire life with her, he also spent his entire life being told that it was his great, wonderful honor and that everything would be fine. But now he knows that there are many more situations than he realized in which the lives and the pain of humans are not prioritized. It is the larva, it is the eggs that are prioritized. 
But then also Tika Toy had to make a choice as well. Not only does she let the eggs stay in Gan, knowing that there are guns in the house, but there are also moments at the end of the scene where she is able to physically control him because she's much larger and stronger, but she chooses not to even when he accidentally hurts her. And that's a contrast to earlier in the story where there's a po moment where she knocks him off his feet because she's frustrated with him. But even with that act of physical abuse, he's like, oh no, it it's my fault. I wasn't moving quickly enough. I totally understand. So mm -hmm. what does this mean in the context of slavery, but also a loving relationship? On one hand, it makes sense to me how Gan specifically could feel what he would define as love for this person that he's been raised with, that has protected him outside the wall, that is the reason his family exists, and because of individual parts of her personality and quirks, things that I didn't mention that make her distinct, that he genuinely enjoys about spending time with her. But also there's the context of this relationship and the larger scope in a world in which the tax humans pay for occupying this land on another, uh, on another planet is that they have limited freedom, they have limited choices when it comes to things they can own like cars and guns, and one person from each family must undergo this. I have so many thoughts and so many questions still, but I hope you can see where some of this back and forth balances. Because on one hand, I totally understand it if you view this story as the aliens are making the humans bear their young, and it's a terrible, painful process, and people die. You know, they have no consent, they have no bodily autonomy. You know, they're keeping them on this preserve. Why can't they just live peacefully outside that? And then it's all about that. But on the other hand, I also see why an alien species would not be keen to just letting humans run amok on their planet, especially once they find out what the humans did on their last planet. I also understand the fact that for some of the Tlick, they see the condition of the humans as an improvement as compared to where they were. So what right do they have to complain? And we see in the story two examples of humans and aliens who have in their own words a loving beneficial relationship in which they generally care for each other but we're also told about stories of other people who do not have those relationships so does the relationship itself in any way excuse the machinations of the world or is it simply is what it is i'd spent very little time i spent no time in this story talking about gan's mother but i think she's a fascinating character and i hope you pay attention to her really and listen to the words she says if slash when please when you read this book because she is someone who is basically resigned to die. She knows that drinking the sterile eggs of the Tlick will help her live longer, but she is so done. She was best friends with Tiga Toy when they were growing up and growing into their adult forms before Tiga Toy became this big political leader. She was the one that promised Gan to Tiga Toy because she would rather have a friend implant eggs in her child as opposed to just some random alien but as the date grows nearer when gan is going to have to undergo this she becomes distant and cold she is manipulated by tika toy and forced to do things she doesn't want to do to make her relax to make her calm down and it's a situation in which her form of rebellion is a very internal resistance is trying to put up a wall between her and tika toy trying to block everything out and allowing herself to die while Gan's older, older brother is reckless and selfish and, you know, gloats at the fact that he's not the one that's been chosen to put eggs in. He used to try to run away from the preservation, run away to other houses, but without realizing that there's nowhere to run to. This is what it is. But if he had his way, he would take up guns and kill every single alien on the planet. And I think all of their reactions, all of their understandings, all of their, I don't even want to say goals, but they don't think they're thinking that far in the future because they can't are valid. And again, in this broader context, it makes me wonder. I would argue, yes, the relationship between Tan and Tiga Toy and the Tlick and the Terrans is symbiotic in many ways. They do need each other in many ways. But inherently loving, can love exist, real love exist under these conditions? When you have two creatures, one of which is politically much more powerful than one, one which is physically <laughs> much more powerful than the other, and one that is much, much older, has more experience, more life, all of these things than the other. But even with all of those things, does that dismiss or invalidate Gan's choice in the end to be impregnated? And if it does dismiss his choice, his choice to either kill himself, bear the eggs, or let his sister bear the eggs, how does he reckon with his feelings 
of feeling protective, of his feelings of feeling possessive of Tikutoi, of wanting him for himself, and feeling comfort in this loving embrace toward the end after the eggs have been implanted, and hearing her say that she'll always protect him and never leave him, but also still thinking about the gun he has hidden in the kitchen. It is a fascinating, amazing story, and I think it is a perfect little microcosm to have a larger discussion about authorial intent and audience interpretation. Because as you can tell, I am on, I don't even want to say on both sides, as if there are only two, I am all over the place. I've read the story twice now, and each time I am constantly trying to figure out which human character I identify with the most, which uh, way of trying to survive and cope I feel is something that I would try to do, but also looking at it as someone who isn't in that situation, in terms of looking at an ecosystem and at two coexisting civilizations, what makes the most sense? Because Octavia Butler has put on record that she thinks that if humans make it to other planets, we will have to pay the rent. We're not going to waltz in there and take it over or just set up shop as if we own the place. And is the rent that uh, they ask for in Bloodchild, is that fair? And is that fair also considering the ways that we demand or expect other humans to pay the rent in America? I mean, I'm sure you've heard arguments that... Um, immigrants, undocumented or otherwise, should be forced to join the military so that way they can really serve the country that they claim to love, they can serve the country that they came to. Something that is incredibly dangerous and could kill them, talking about bodily autonomy, but we still have these ideas. Some of us still have these ideas. So I could probably talk about this for another 30 minutes. There are so many more like in little scenes and moments and gestures I would love to unpack, but I just wanted to kind of do an overview about the ideas of authorial intent and audience interpretation in this fantastic, amazing, show-stopping, incredible, insert Lady Gaga meme here, short story by Octavia Butler. So I hope that gave you a lot to think about. I hope that piqued your interest in the story. And as always, of course, I hope you have a good day.